right? Many of us have switched to 520 chain and sprocket kits on our 125s back in the day. Can you discuss the pros and cons of using a 428 chain and sprocket kit today? Here's one, because occasionally I get one that's a little off the uh, little off the norm, as usual. I enjoy your show, especially a few episodes where you covered some vintage races. How do you keep your hair in place all the time in the studio and when you're out in the field? <laughs> you know, I've got a little tip for you, and it's probably one of the most uh, frequently asked questions I get on this show. How do I do it? LA looks, extreme sport. That's how I keep my hair in place, both out in the field and in the studio. I've used it for years. I get it at Walgreens. It's just $2.99. That's LA looks, extreme sport. Get some today. I don't know. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vintage Motocross q and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. Thank you, Jordan, Susie, and Chelsea for help putting the show together tonight. And thank you at home, the viewers who are watching. We've got something a little bit different for you tonight. You can call it a rewind show. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my first Facebook live feed. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Abadi. I'm Joe Abadi. I'm your host, Joe Abadi. I'm Joe Abadi. I'm Joe Abadi. And I'm your host, Joe Abadi. You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. Welcome to Vintage Motocross Q&A. You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. Vintage Motocross Q&A. Vintage Motocross. 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 Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Abadi, and you're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. You can call it a rewind show, sort of a best of segment, if you would. We've got some interesting things coming up, and we're going to be taking a look at them right now. Restoration, an item that has been refinished back as closely to it was made originally. When it comes to vintage motocross bikes, this is always something that becomes a very touchy subject. Because in my opinion, there are, well, there are three, three definitions of what a restoration could be when it comes to vintage motocross. The first one, of course, is a Concours restoration. The second one is a back to brochure. And the third one is a period correct modification. Let's talk about the first one, the Concours. This is where a bike such as this is not only restored, but the fit and finish, maybe the paint, the hardware is actually above what came from a dealer, what you would see on a showroom floor. This bike in particular is an excellent example where the hubs are polished a little higher in luster than they normally would be. The sprocket, the, uh, the kickstarter, the paint, the fit and the finish of the bike, everything about it is just a level above what you would see in a normal restoration. I would consider this a Concours restoration. The next one up is back to brochure. This is exactly how you would see a bike back when it was on the showroom floor in 1973 or 1974, whatever year it might be. The bike looks exactly as it did after restoration, as it did when it was on the showroom floor. The next picture, we see a back to brochure restoration. This was done by my friend, Bill Mashell. It certainly is exemplary. It's the definition, in my opinion, of a back to brochure restoration. Everything about the bike from the decals on the number plates to the way the finish is on the black, the polish on the, uh, on the wheels, but it's not overdone. Did a beautiful job. That's a back to brochure restoration. Next up, a period correct modified restoration. And you're going to see where I'm going with this in just a minute. Period correct modified restoration to me means the bike was restored with everything you would see in a back to brochure restoration where the fit, the finish, the color, 
everything is the way it should be. However, aftermarket parts have been added to the bike and were not modified in any way in order to get them on the bike. In other words, if a bike happened to have a pair of Fox gasser shocks on it, which were blue and orange, uh, they would be blue and orange when they were on the bike. This is a great example. It's got an FMF pipe that's painted red the way it came from FMF. It's got the porcupine head, it's got the extenders on the forks, everything else looks as it did if you were to buy this bike off the showroom floor with all these modifications or as some of the aftermarket people did, uh, DG, FMF, they sold something called a package racer. Now let's just, let's just stay right here with this picture for a minute, Jordan, because I want to I wanna say a couple of things. Where I get a little perturbed, and I see it less and less lately, I don't know if it's because I've had something to say on Facebook about it, but where I get perturbed is where people will put in their ads, especially when selling a bike, not necessarily where they're just posting a bike in a group or a forum to talk about it, but where they're going to sell a bike, they'll put restored, no expense spared, meticulous restoration. It's fantasy in so many ways. To me, there are only three. The Concours restoration, the back to brochure restoration, and what you see right here, the period correct modified restoration. The next picture, I'm going to show you a bike, and I hope it's not anybody's bike that's actually watching this show. Um, I'm not going to say anything disparaging about the bike because it really isn't anything to say. But someone, or I have seen advertisements many times where someone will say, meticulous restoration, no expense spared. You may not have spared any expenses when it came to putting parts on that bike, like the Fox shocks or the black rims, or going for a paint job like you have on the tank. But that doesn't mean it's a meticulous restoration. Great looking bike. What is it? In my opinion, it's a restored racer. It is a, uh, a restored racer is really, really what it is. A race, uh, race rebuild is what I would call it. I, I don't believe in the word restoration either. So many people out there over the years have come up with so many different words uh, to, to describe a bike. A, re a, a restoration, a, uh, a resto mod. Resto mod to me is something that happens in a hot rod, hot rod world, not necessarily in vintage motocross. Resto mod means it looks old, like you might take a 64 Corvette and you might have a modern chassis underneath there, modern suspension, disc brakes, different things that you would have on a much more modern vehicle that are hidden underneath the body of that Corvette or a Camaro or whatever else it may be. Those to me are resto mods. Bikes like this are not really a resto mod. That's just how I see it, and I hope you agree with me, or at least you understand my opinion. This is a question I've been waiting to ask you. I can't, uh -oh. tell, I can't tell you. For I long. didn't do it. No, I know you didn't. No, actually, I did. Do you it? did do it. Uh. <laughs> Everybody out there who's watching, I'm sure you've seen the picture many times of Jimmy Weiner at the Oakland Coliseum. Oh, I did do it. <laughs> I think it's 1979. He's on a factory Kawasaki. He's got a neck brace on, and he's using this infamous paddle tire. It's a big deal. He's throwing sand every place it goes. Hannah's going blind. He can't see why it ruins the race. <laughs> every time we see this picture on the internet, there are all these, oh, people think they have knowledge of what actually happened there. The paddle tire was, gave so much torque. Jimmy's neck was snapping back. Where did the paddle tire come from? Now, I know the answer to this. Do you want to start with that? Or you want to start with the neck brace? Because that's before the paddle tire. All right, let's start with the neck brace. Uh, Why did Jimmy have a neck brace on that day? We were screwing around in the rental car. Jimmy was driving. So, no, I did not do that part. Okay. Jimmy was driving, and I had a ranch in Northern California with a motocross track, a big hill. So, anyway, he's Jimmy's the wheel man. You know, he's pretty good at the wheel. So we're in there in the car and he, we come flying up. It's a dirt road, a mild dirt road up to where the ranch is. Then it's a big hill. So Jimmy's going, how far do you think this thing will go up the hill? I go, I don't know, find out. So he goes up the hill as far as it goes until it's getting stuck. Then he turns around. Instead of just coming back down, he starts whipping it, you know, side to side and catches a cow trail or something. Seven snapper rolls. I mean, we had a record for beat Earnhardt for like 20 years. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. We had the record of snapper rolls. And... Uh, he was going 200 in Daytona, and we still got more. <laughs> anyway, so the roof is laying on the the headrest. Jimmy's head's hanging out that little area, whatever it is. 
I'm, I was in the front seat, but I'm in the back seat with my pants ripped off. And uh, we call, my dad's there and Lori's there, so they're calling the ambulance and they come and they get him and take him to the hospital. I think he's got a broken neck and he's probably dead. But he didn't have a broken neck, luckily, and he just had a bad, bad sprain. So they put him in a neck brace. And this was, we were we came up for a press conference for, before for that race, for the mm -hmm. Oakland Coliseum race. Anyway, I don't think we went because he was hurt and I was kind of had some injuries too. Anyway, so we go to the track day before, whenever they practice, and it was really Okay, so you're, you get this tire from France because you're racing on the beach there. I, yeah, I brought it back to the States with me because it was so cool, and I figured, well, Rio Vista is the same place where I practice and stuff. I'd, I'd use it somewhere and have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I go look at the track with Jimmy because I didn't ride that time because I had a leg injury from that crash. And so I go, Jimmy, I got this tire. I think this tire would work here. Well, yeah, what is it? I go, it's a paddle tire. Nobody even heard about it over here. He never knew what it was. I didn't know what it was until three months earlier. Anyway, so I talk him into using it, which he can talk to Jammer into pretty much anything. So anyway, he puts it on and then uh, history is like you said, he was killing Hannah, Hannah screaming, crying, wanting a protest because he can't see and the tire is so crazy. And they outlaw it after that night after he wins. But uh, he had the neck brace because he crashed the car and flipped it seven times. And I gave him the tire that I got in Lot 2K and he used it and he won the race. And that's what really happened. That's what really happened. So the next time you see that picture of Jimmy Weiner in Oakland with the neck brace, remember the Ford LTD, Brad Lackey <laughs> doing the snap rolls. I'll make it look like it started first kick. It does sometimes. Oh, almost. Next segment is brought to you by Classic and Vintage Dirt Bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life. And doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. We make and sell a wide range of new parts to replace the hard to find components you need to keep your vintage bike performing. We'll keep you supplied without any hassle or hunting. So you can get out, get back on track, and keep riding. For performance parts made with modern engineering, Vinco is the online store you can trust. To help keep your classic bike on the trail and running smooth. Vinco, keep the ride going. As you've seen from previous episodes, it is our quest and we are continuing on that journey to replicate the 1974 RC 125 that Marty Smith rode to the inaugural 125cc national championship. This week I want to talk to you a little bit more about the airbox. In previous episodes we showed you the difference between a stock airbox and this feathery light fiberglass airbox that we had made. This week I'm going to show you a little bit more about the filter, the filter cage, and how it all goes together and it's going to fit in the frame. I'm going to put it all together right in front of you right now and then we're going to get a shot of it in the frame. What I wanted to do was make sure everything fit properly before we put the thing together in its final stages. This air filter was laying in a bag. I had some oil on it, but it was just laying in there. We'll re-oil it when the time comes. The filter fit nicely in the cage. By the way, this filter happens to be from a Suzuki, and so is the filter cage. It all fit together real nicely, and it also comes with this wing nut with this long screw on it. You put that in, and inside the air box itself, is an aluminum flange that's molded in and it's threaded. It's threaded, of course, to fit that wing nut. 
you can put the whole thing together. It all sits in there very securely. There you can see the filter from one side. It does fit in there really well. These two clamps that came with this other part, which is the air boot, the clamps are really nice. They're already plated with uh, black zinc. The air boot is from actually a Mako. And we're going to need that because we're going to need some flexibility when we go to put our bigger carburetor on the back of that reed valve cylinder. So we discovered that a Mako air boot would work really well, give us a little flexibility when it comes time to putting that air boot over the back of the bell. That air boot fits on there real tight, real nicely. The clamp was absolutely a perfect fit. The other clamp, of course, we'll be putting into use once we get the carburetor in place. That's it for this segment of the 522 Project. I again want to thank our sponsor, Full Circle Racing, for being a sponsor of this segment. This is the interview I've been waiting for all day. Gino, how does it feel to go from the Concord Poodle Rescue into being a celebrity on Facebook? In the Moto Showcase tonight, it is brought to you by Preston Petty Products. We're going to be telling you about a special they have coming up in just a few minutes. But right now, I want to tell you about a 1971 Mako 125 with Kramer and Will Smith modifications that was sent, to, sent in to us by Dan Vitaletti. As Jordan goes through the slides, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Dan told me about this beautiful machine. Circa 71 Mako 125 is a surviving example of when motocross machines were modified to keep them competitive. A revolution in the design of suspension systems was underway during the mid 70s. In the early 70s, when riders were demanding more and more suspension travel, Fritz Kramer in Germany developed a double shock cantilever rear swing arm conversion kit for the Mako MXers. Later years, Kramer marketed complete bikes with his own design frame equipped with Mako and later Rotax engines. This machine was purchased new from Motorsport Chester Honda in West Chester, Pennsylvania and was picked up at Eastern Mako. The Kramer and Will Smith modifications were done around 1976 in an attempt to keep the bike a little more competitive. It was raced mostly in District 6 as well as races in Virginia and Daytona, Florida. I purchased the bike, Dan Vitaletti did, in 2018 from the original owner who had it in storage for the last several decades. I completely disassembled the bike and performed the complete mechanical and light cosmetic refurbishment. The gas tank and fender patina were preserved as it was last race sometime in the mid 70s. Several of the modifications and upgrade components included did rims, Tomaselli handlebars, Electron 30 millimeter carburetor, Wheel Smith foot pegs, Wheel Smith front brake anchor bracket, Kramer rear suspension conversion, twin S&W shocks, a Wheel Smith fork extension kit, Mako 125 RS road race spec rotary valve and cylinder. Dan Vitaletti, this is quite an amazing bike. I want to thank you so much for letting us feature it here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. There you can see those two shocks up there inside the airbox on this Kramer Mako Wheel Smith Mako 125. A very, very rare bike just in stock trim let alone with the Will Smith goodies on it and the Kramer uh, modifications as well. Dan Vitaletti, for sending your bike into us, we are going to get you a nice gift, compliments of Preston Petty products. You'll be receiving something in the mail for us within a few days. I'll be sending it out to you tomorrow. Dan Vitaletti, thanks once again for sending that bike into us, and thank you, Preston Petty products, for being a sponsor of this segment. Well, the time has come. After many, many months of talking about it, we are ready to give away the 1983 Honda CR250. Well, that feels like a good one. That feels like a good one? That feels like a good one. Okay. I'm more nervous probably than the people that are watching, huh? <laughs> the winning number is number 665. 665. Six, Let's six, take a six. look on the list. 665 is Tony Bender. Tony Bender, you are the winner of the 1983 Honda CR250, number 665. Tony, if you are watching the show tonight or anybody knows Tony, have him call in. We would love to talk to him. Have him call us at area code 911, number 665. Tony Bender, you are the winner of the 1983 Honda CR250. Brad, thanks so much. Congratulations, Congratulations Tony. Tony. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Here's the winning number.
We're with Ed Sims, and we're taking a look at a 1966 CZ 250 Twin Port. Ed, tell me something. How long have you owned this bike? How often do you race it? Well, I try to race it every chance I get. I've had it for probably about 10 years, and uh, I rebuilt it, and then I had a great guy, Mark Alcorn, help me with it, and uh, it's been a really fun bike just because you don't see that many Twin Ports. So how many horsepower is this bike, and is it competitive against other bikes in its class, or is this one of the, the best bikes to have in that, in that class? Well, uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, um, the Osas, the Lettos are in this class. They're, they're very fast. Uh, it's probably even with the Husky 250, which back in the day, the, the CZ and the Husky were the preeminent bikes. So, Ed, tell me this. When you're not out racing vintage motocross, what do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a dentist in Sacramento. Dennis from Sacramento with a 67 CZ 250 Twin Port. Ed, thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. How many countries have you raced in? Uh, I counted one time, I was a little over 50 countries. Over 50 countries? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is absolutely just incredible. Now, after the 88 season, finishing third in the 250 GPs, the, you did have a ride in '89 as well. Yeah, you rode, you rode the GPs. that next year. I was finished, I was right up to third to the last race or last moment. I broke a silencer or something. Mm -hmm. um, it was a different. Um, I do have to say, like for me, Brazil, I, I gained all my confidence. I had a really good team behind me, good people behind me, and stuff like that. And when I I, I could have probably I'd still be living there if I stayed. Um, I had everything. I had everything I wanted. I had stardom. I had money. I had everything I wanted, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to go. I wanted to be challenged more. So hmm. GP motocross is what I wanted to go do. I wanted to get out of Brazil. I was winning too much down there, too easy. I wanted more. So that's why I went to Europe. But when I got to Europe, it was hard because um, Rinaldi was, I went to Rinaldi. He was retiring that year and he rode for Suzuki. So he was putting together the team, still being sponsored with Suzuki kind of become the team manager and hired me as a rider. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of years, I think was a learning curve for him even because it was almost as if I had to ride the bike how he rode it. So I struggled a lot with bike setup and, and motor setup and stuff like that because I, even though I brought my mechanic with me from Brazil was one of the deals, we still had his main mechanic that did all the main stuff on the bike. Who was that mechanic? Uh, Aldo, it was Aldini. I um, can't remember what his last name was. And then I brought over Pedro Ibanez, which was my mechanic from Brazil, which actually was from Spain. But, um, and, and they wouldn't let us set the bike up like we wanted to. You know, I had to ride it like Rinaldi did. Yeah. And I think over the first, next couple of years, Rinaldi kind of learned from that. You know, like he had to step back and let us set the bike up how we wanted to do it because each rider's an, an individual. You know, everybody rides different, everybody has different settings. And... In the expansion chamber tonight, that is brought to you by Full Circle Racing Limited, Fritz Gunther has sent in a video uh, of a really great tip. Let's get a look at it uh, right now. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Another shop tip. When you're rebuilding your engines, these muffin tins, cupcake trays, uh, they work great for putting all the parts in. As you pull your parts off the engine, you can start upper left, upper right, and just as things come off in order, you just put them in the muffin tins. They, uh, they work great for that. Plus, uh, if you take the old ones out of your wife's kitchen, then uh, make sure you get her some new ones before you steal the ones that she uses. So. Good way to get some points with the little misses. Also, these little squeeze bottles are available. Amazon, eBay, uh, I forget what they call them. There's a name the lab rats call them, but uh, I just put on the left, I've got, you know, gear oil. I've got two stroke oil. On the right, I've got some soap suds, which is, you know, helps with tires. And also I use it for doing pressure checks on engines, looking for leaks. So. Just another little tip for you guys. Hope it helps. See you at the track. Great tip from Fritz Gunther on uh, how to keep your nuts and bolts organized in your shop and a little marital advice in there as well.
Our next clips are brought to you by Northwest Mako CZ. I want to thank Alan Brown and Northwest Mako CZ for all their support here on the show. Let's see what we got. My name's Jim Jenkins. I'm from Modesto, California, and this is my 1977 AW400 Mako. a barn find. It's a rebuild, not a restoration. My whole idea was to make it into a racer. The motor was done by Jeff Mullins at Mako Works. I did the suspension myself. We've got uh, go leans on the rear and full race tech up front with the, uh, with the gold valve or uh, emulators, whatever you want to call them. Um, the bike was in great shape to begin with. We took it apart, went through everything, rebuilt the crank. JP Morgan redid the head for me. So we got the, the Hemi type head, so it starts easy, runs great. All right. So the bike's been raced one time only at the CZ World Championships. Normally I ride all CZs, but I had my Mako there. Won both motos, so basically it's undefeated. Photographie en couleur. Pellicule Aqua Color 100. Aqua Color 100, la vie s'écrit en Aqua. Amsoil, the first in synthetic oil since 1973. They are the sponsor of our next segment. Thank you, Russell Waters, for all you do for us here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. Let's take a look at this clip. You're on the Dupla team. You're racing for CZ. You're able to go to other countries and race GPs now. However, you can't take your family with you. How did he get you to see some of the other countries that he went to in Europe? <clears throat> so it is, it, again, it is very complicated. And uh, for anyone who never lived in socialism in the communist country, it is really hard to explain. It's really hard to understand. So traveling to the West was not allowed. Even under the Dukla umbrella, uh, we still had to have special visa, special approvals to go. And then upon the return, we would have to fill forms. Who did we talk to? Why did we talk to them? How long and where and whatnot? So one of the things that really took out from us was traveling abroad to GPs. And instead of just cutting through Germany to France, from one GP to another, we would have to trek back thousands and thousands of kilometers to renew visa to a different country, get an approval and go there. <clears throat> so we lost a lot of time on the road just to get paperwork from A to B. It was, it was a trip to France where uh, they smuggled uh, me and my mom covered with sleeping bags. That was after dad left Dukla, after 84, he went private with uh, Stodulka and Novacek, and they were on their own, so they were not risking the Dukla spot anymore. However, they were, you know, risking their family. Uh, so what happened was uh, we still had to get visas and uh, documentation filled in for Falta, Novacek, and Stoduka to go race. But my mom and I did not get visa all the way to France. We only went to Western Germany. So Falta was traveling with mom and me. I was four years old. I My mom was pregnant with my brother. And Stoduka was traveling with his wife and two kids. Well, um, when they made it across Germany, close to France, they saw that the border patrol is not really doing their job or it was the middle of the night or whatnot. So they took a chance and say, let's, let's play hide and seek. And uh, they would cover pregnant mom in sleeping bags. And they threw, I remember being in a stack of tires playing hide and seek with a blanket over me. I remember the blanket stank with gasoline. And uh, so we were two cars and Stodulka uh, smuggled his wife and his two children 
two friends and we end up um, having a wonderful vacation in southern France for two weeks. And then they lost me there. So <laughs> that was uh, parents of the year. And greetings all listeners. Ciao. Hi. <laughs> ciao, See you next later. Ciao, ciao. 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 Dale Carmine, what would you suggest paint or powder coat on a rebuild? Which would you choose for a race bike or a show bike? Does it reflect the value if I were to go sell this bike? This is becoming an age old question, much like what should I mix my oil and gas at or how much fork oil does my motorcycle take? Look, I look at it this way. Paint to show, powder coat to go. Bikes didn't come with powder coating when they were new. You're saying you're doing a rebuild here, Carmine. So what I would say is, that you should powder coat the bike if you're gonna go out and race it. It's not really gonna hurt the price because when you go to sell the bike, you're gonna be selling it as a race bike anyway. So if it's powder coated, it's powder coated. It's gonna last a little bit longer. It's gonna look a little bit better. Some people will disagree. You'll hear a couple of different opinions on whether you should powder coat or not. I'm a big fan of it on race bikes. I've never had a problem with it. If it's gonna be a show bike, you paint it, race bike, you can powder coat it. It's not gonna affect the price when you go to sell it. Thanks for sending in the question. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Who's in charge here? The Motion Pro. It's a gasket scraper. I really love how it feels. It's a good, sturdy tool. It's got a very sharp blade on it. We're going to get close right now, and I'm going to show you exactly how this little guy works and why you should buy one. This gasket is on this, the base of this cylinder. It's on here pretty good. But as you can see, when you go to pull off a piece of it, you'll always have a little, little section stuck on whatever surface it might be. It could be a cylinder, it could be a clutch cover, it could be a, a set of cases. So let's try this little tool from Motion Pro. And I like the angle of this too, the way the blade is angled, how you can hold it in your hand and uh, really get down there with a little leverage on it and begin to scrape that gasket right away. And it does a nice job of getting all the little glue and pieces of gasket that are on there, get them all off. It's just a real nice way to remove gaskets safely and cleanly from whatever it is that you're working on. There it is, gasket scraper from Motion Pro. Also comes with a little extra blade in there too. Well, that's it for the next time try this segment. I want to thank Vintco for being a sponsor and I want to suggest that you guys get over to Motion Pro and get yourself one of these little gasket scrapers. It's a great item to have in your toolbox. Thanks for watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. We'll see you next week. Oh. All right. What are you doing? Tony Banker. Tony Banker. That's, that's where I know that name from. The, the Valachi paper. Uh, what's his name? Where's Dion? I think he's probably doesn't want it. Oh, the what was the guy doing?